good afternoon, but I'm so sorry to do that to folks. Uh, and interrupt their lunch, right? No, I don't mind interrupting your lunch, to be honest with you, but that just that mic sound right from nothing. It's a great sound because we've got good people working the sound. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob Solomon, and I have the privilege of being up here every week. I get to introduce interesting people and interesting topics and get a camera in my face, too. But, you know, today it's not necessarily, I have to start off with some not so great news. We have been around a long time as an organization, since 1956, and we have some people who have been with us probably since about 1954. And you know, that was my, my birth year, but I wasn't here at the time. And some of those people, well, you know, they just don't last forever. And I just learned today that last week Rod Bunnell passed away. And also a week ago today, one of our longtime members and former board member, um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, Al Falcone, pa uh, oh, hold it. He's at ICU at the last word, having had a stroke, and hopefully the prognosis was good, and I've been passing around this get well card that we will get to him later today. I did have some communication with his wife, and again, as of last Friday, the prognosis was positive, but that is the last inf latest information I have. Now, if anybody hasn't signed this card, I'm going to leave it right at the top of this table. And please do, if you know Al, and if you would wish to, please don't forget to sign before you leave. That's the only really difficult news. Today is also Election Day, and you're saying, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. All you have to do is look up north and see what's happening in a three-way race that's been very exciting for those of you that have watched or even taken a look at the occasional article in an American newspaper. Uh, there's quite a history up there, and today there looks like there's going to be change. It's interesting. 67% of Canadians want to change the government, but it's a three-party system, and when the election started, they each had roughly 30% of the vote. I'm really bad at math, but it's made for an incredibly exciting election. So tonight, the results will come in, and we'll see who Obama gets to talk with on Tuesday. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my stuff, because I was born in Canada, but I do find that election interesting. And now we're going to shift to what we're all here for. Today, we're really fortunate. We have Mr. Kerry Timchuk, who is the executive director of the Oregon Historical Society. And even though we're making history every day, we can't forget the history we've made. Ladies and gentlemen, Kerry Timchuk. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I'm the second Tim Chuck to be here this year. My wife Becky was here in uh, May before when she was a candidate for the school board, a victorious candidate for the school board, and now serves, of course, with John's uh, wife on, on the school board. So, pleasure to be here. And uh, Mr. President, I also have Canadian blood flowing through my veins. Uh, my father was born in Canada, uh, immigrated down here as a young man. On his side, I'm first generation. Uh, Oregonian, and on my mother's side, I'm fifth generation Oregonian. She was uh, from Oregon Pioneer Stock, so maybe fitting then that I'm at the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, we've been around since 1898, uh, for 117 years, OHS has, uh, with the mission of preserving, protecting, safeguarding, educating, entertaining folks about all things Oregon history. Uh, we are we have a showplace uh, office down at uh, 1200 Southwest Park in Portland, the Oregon History Museum. and. Uh, we have a world-class research library there, two floors of exhibits. Uh, we have a 100,000 square foot warehouse in Gresham, where we keep the vast majority of our collection, which includes some 85,000 artifacts, 20,000 maps, 25,000 books, two and a half million photographs, and six million feet of videotape. So the largest Oregon-based collection uh, in the country of, of items relating to Oregon history. We do a variety of programs around the state. Uh, we are not the Portland Historical Society or the Metro Historical Society. We are the Oregon Historical Society. Uh, collect all things Oregon. So we uh, have programs and lectures and uh, travel around the state. Uh, we also have a, a website that gets a million hits a year. Uh, in programs such as the Oregon Encyclopedia, the Oregon History Project on our website where you can access uh, great peer-reviewed articles on, on Oregon history. Uh, Right now, we have uh, downtown, we have, I think, one of the finest exhibits we've had in our history. It's a World War II exhibit. Uh, it's the third exhibit we've done with the collection of uh, Portland real estate businessman, uh, philanthropist Pete Mark. Pete, for 50 years, has collected presidential artifacts and American historical treasures, acquiring really one of the finest private collections in the country. 
And uh, this is the third exhibit we've done with him. We did one which was kind of a retrospective of his collection. Last year we did a Lincoln-specific exhibit. This year it's all about World War II, this being the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. The exhibit continues until December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, uh, when it will close. Uh, it was opened in June, but it includes such items as uh, the only copy of the Atlantic Charter signed by Churchill and Roosevelt, uh, Eisenhower's jacket, Patton's uniform, Patton's stag antler handled revolver, uh, the silk aviator's map that was aboard the Enola Gay that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, uh, and the, the highlight for many people is the Enigma machine. We, Pete has a Nazi code machine, if you saw the movie The Imitation Game. It was all about the British building this big supercomputer to try to solve the code of this little machine, the Enigma machine. We have one of those. Uh, Harry Truman's poker table, believe it or not. A collection of handwritten letters from, that Ike wrote to Mamie during the war. Uh, and about two-thirds of the exhibit is the world story using Pete's collection. And one-third is the Oregon story using our collection, telling the story of how World War II transformed Oregon. Uh, the Kaiser shipyards, which brought people into Portland. Uh, the, the population of Portland increased by almost 40% during the World War II years, including the, really the first large uh, in, immigration of African Americans into Portland who worked in the shipyards. Uh, led to the building of the city of Vanport to house the workers. And of course, the Vanport famously destroyed by a flood in 1948. We tell the story of the, the tragic internment of Japanese Americans. And the story of the attacks on Oregon soil. Not many people know that Oregon was actually attacked uh, during World War II. Uh, the Japanese submarine pulled up outside the coast of Astoria, lobbed a few shells at Fort Stevens, the army base there, uh, destroying only the baseball backstop. Missed the rest of the base. One again off the coast of Brookings. Uh, they built an uh, airplane on the deck of the submarine, flew over and dropped bombs to try to start forest fires to create panic. Uh, didn't work. And the most notorious incident, uh, the only, how many of you knew here that the only casualties from enemy attack and World War II occurred in Oregon, uh, outside of Lakeview, uh, the balloon bombs. Towards the end of the war, the Japanese floated over thousands of balloon bombs uh, across the whole Pacific. A uh, few, about 150, 160, they believe, made it over. Uh, one landed outside of Lakeview in a little place called Bly. A minister and his wife and five 11 to 13 year old children on a church outing. Uh, the minister was parking the car. His wife and the children went into the woods. He heard his wife say, look what we found. And seconds later, a huge explosion. They touched the bomb, and they were all killed, the wife and the five 11 to 13-year-olds. So six people actually died here in Oregon by enemy attack during World War II. Um, little, little known uh, fact of Oregon history. So that exhibit, as I said, runs through December. Uh, if you haven't been down there yet, get down there. Uh, courtesy of a very generous donation from uh, our good friends at Columbia Sportswear. All current and former military personnel and their families have free admission to come see the exhibit. Um, so uh, it, if you're not a member of OHS, by the way, my, I'd be guilty of malpractice if I didn't say go to www.ohs.org and, and uh, sign up. Uh, membership brings with it free admission to the museum, uh, a subscription to the Oregon Historical Quarterly, which has been published for 100 years with great peer-reviewed articles on Oregon history, all the mailings, all the, uh, the special uh, deals we have. Uh, we have David McCullough, the great historian, coming out at the end of this month on October 30th to give a lecture on his new book, The Wright Brothers, his new bestseller. Uh, he's you know, America's favorite historian. Uh, the Pete called, Mr. Mark called me the other day to say uh, that he just bought the compass that Charles Lindbergh held in his hand as he flew across the Atlantic. And I said, oh, Pete, that's amazing. We have to have that on display when McCullough's here talking about the Wright brothers. And then Pete said, oh, I forgot about that. I need to buy something from the Wright brothers, too. So, which he called me today to say that he has. So we'll have something from the Wright brothers up as well. So uh, he's, he's a, great, uh, a great supporter to have of the Oregon Historical Society and sharing his collection with us. And uh, I told, talked to you about our vault. And I raided our vault here to, and brought a few of my favorite items out here to share with you. I'm a big believer in uh, not being a professional museum person, as most of my predecessors were at Historical Society. I came from a different background. As some of you know, I came from a public service background. I uh, spent uh, a lot of years in Washington, D.C. was 12 years here in Oregon as the chief of staff to Gordon Smith. Worked for Bob Dole for six years in Washington, D.C. So 
come from a different background, so I, I like to let people touch history and hold history. So I brought some history uh, for you today to touch and hold. <coughs> <laughs> So the first item, very heavy, is a piece of this. This is uh, the Willamette meteorite, one of the largest meteorites ever to hit North America. Six feet by 10 feet, weighed 16 tons, 32,000 pounds. It's 91% iron, 7% magnesium, 2% chocolate, and it came from, kidding about that chocolate part. It uh, came from a, a planet that exploded, of course, up in the outer space and worked its way here, a chunk of it. It landed, scientists believe, in present-day Montana or British Columbia, and then washed down to Oregon in the Missoula floods that transformed the landscape of the Northwest. Again, it was, it was six feet by 10 feet, weighed 16 tons. It settled in present-day Lake Oswego, West Lynn area, where it set undetected for eons upon eons upon eons upon end, until the first Oregonians, uh, the Native Americans, the tribe, discovered it, regarded it as a piece of the moon that had been sent down for their spiritual ceremonies. And they would gather around it and drink the water that had gathered in the indentations of the meteorite, the rainwater, in hopes of gaining immortality. It didn't work. Uh, they didn't become immortal. The tribe, over time, moves away, dies out, loses sight of the fact that it was there, it sits again for more years in a very wooded forested area, which explains why people didn't see it, until 1902, 1902, a Welsh immigrant farmer named Ellis Hughes, who had the land next door to where this meteorite was, was logging illegally on his neighbor's property, uh, discovers it, realizes what it is, and decides that he has to have it. Well, his first thought, somewhat honest, was to buy the property next door without, of course, telling the owners what he discovered on it. And ironically, given that it's 91% iron, it ended up on property owned by the Oregon Iron and Steel Company. His next thought, think he can't raise, he can't raise the money to buy the property, so his next thought, a little less honest, steal it. Again, this weighed 16 tons. This was 1902, the bulldozer, the hydraulic lift, had not quite been invented yet. So armed with nothing more than a horse and his teenage son, he spends three back-breaking months devising a way to get this meteorite over to his property. It includes, and there's a picture of him and his teenage son, building a Flintstone-like little log railroad cart out of, you know, log wheels, log to uh, put it on. After the horse walking around in endless circles, you know, slowly lifts it out of the muck. And then to move it uh, the three quarters of a mile over to his territory, or over to his land, he has to uh, build a piece of track because the ground is too marshy. So he builds a little six foot to eight foot piece of track. Slowly but surely, the horse moves it over there. Three months later, crosses the property line and being a good entrepreneur, small businessman, he builds a shack around it and starts charging 25 cents admission. <laughs> and the Oregonian of that era reported that all these people flocked out in the trolley and then walked down to the, near the river to see this amazing discovery. Unfortunately, uh, John Tyner, for, uh, for Mr. Hughes, one of the first visitors was the attorney from Oregon Iron and Steel, who couldn't help but notice the tracks going back to his client's property, and the guy didn't cover up his tracks well enough. A three-year-long lawsuit ensues, up and down through the Clackamas County court system, uh, eventually reaching the Oregon Supreme Court, which finally rules once and for all it belongs to Oregon Iron and Steel. In the meantime, the meteorite just sat there, we have pictures sometimes of armed guards on it. We have pictures of kids playing on it. And obviously, over time, somebody knocked a few chunks off. So by the time the court decides, the, the uh, centennial of the Lewis and Clark expedition, the, ex, the, the Lewis and Clark exposition is going on in Portland. The, the World's Fair, essentially, that really put Portland on a map as a major city. So they barge it down, they get it down to the river, barge it down the river, up on a horse-drawn carriage to the World's Fair, Oregon Iron and Steel promising never to let this Oregon treasure leave Oregon. Well, the expo ends, and a few weeks later, they sell it to a New York City socialite for $20,000, big money back in 1905. She gives it to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, where it's been ever since. Oregon's oldest artifact, one of our most treasured artifacts, on display in New York City. Uh, I was there last spring break and went and saw it for the first time. It's very nicely displayed, and it tells the story of the, of the meteorite. Uh, 
But a couple of years ago, the tribal descendants of the original Clackamas tribe, now the Grand Ronde tribe, they filed suit under a new federal law called NAGPRA, the Native American Graveyard Repatriation Act, I believe, essentially saying, give it back. And, and tribes across the country have been winning similar suits. And they reached an out-of-court settlement with the, with the museum, where once a year, the museum flies tribal leaders back to New York City for a religious ceremony at the meteorite. And uh, they did have to promise that if they ever do take it off public display, then ownership will revert back to the tribe. But for now, it remains in New York. <laughs> what I think is our probably most iconic item that people just are fascinated when we bring it out from the vault is, is this. It's a branding iron uh, used not to brand cattle or livestock or uh, horses, but to brand uh, tree trunks perhaps to mark a trail, to brand wooden packing crates, to brand leather satchels. And you'll see the name on the brand, it obviously we've had a big, bigger stick on here, is U.S. Captain, C-A-P-T, M. Lewis. This is Meriwether Lewis's branding iron that he carried with him on the Lewis and Clark expedition. It was made for him in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. So you're all going to be holding something that Meriwether Lewis actually held. Feel free to take a selfie <laughs> if, you want, if you want to with it. Um, Again, one of the really the great artifacts left over from the Lewis and Clark exposition, uh, expedition is, is the branding iron. So people are uh, uh, fascinated with the chance to, to hold something that Meriwether Lewis actually held. Now after Lewis and Clark uh, were here, of course, more and more people start coming out to Oregon. Uh, eventually we become a territory. And eventually we have enough people to have a newspaper. And this is the front page of the first newspaper published west of the Rockies. It's the Oregon Spectator. It was published in Oregon City with the motto, Westward, the Star of Empire Takes Its Way. This is page one, volume one, number one, February 5th, 1846. 1846. He said it has more content than the current Oregonian. That's, he said it looks like it has more content than the current Oregonian. You said that, I didn't, but uh, so. <laughs> so Oregon City was, as you know, originally the uh, commercial and the governmental capital of the Oregon Territory uh, and was thought to go to be the biggest city. The commercial capital eventually moved, of course, to Portland. The governmental capital moved to Salem. Oregon City never achieved, I think, the greatness that the early settlers thought, so the, the spectator did not, did not last. But we have the, the, first, uh, we have the first newspaper published west of the Rockies. We've had some good serial murders. <laughs> <laughs> and then, as more and more Oregonians come into, people come into Oregon, uh, again, they look at the, they want to become a state. And one of the first steps to statehood is to have a constitution. So in 1857, 60 delegates, 60, of course, back then would have been white men, gathered in Salem to draft the Oregon Constitution. And this is the original draft of the preamble of the Oregon Constitution. Uh, very nice, pen, everybody had very nice penmanship back then. Uh, the delegates wrote this, and then they sent it to a vote of the Caucasian men of the territory, about 10,000 at a time, asking three questions. The first question was, do you approve of the Constitution? Overwhelming vote, yes. The second question was, when Oregon enters the Union, which they would in 1859, should we enter as a slave state that bans, that allows slavery, or a free state that banned slavery. And by about a three to one margin, the, the 10,000 Caucasian men of Oregon voted to enter as a free state. But before you feel too good about your ancestors, the third question was, should we allow free African Americans in Oregon, period? And by an eight to one margin, the answer was no. So they, they banned slavery, but they got around the issue by banning any and all African Americans from living in Oregon. That stayed in the Constitution until the 1920s when it was removed by a vote of the people. It was not enforced uh, at, the, at the end, but it was actually in the Constitution. Um, so as, as I say, it, our job at the Historical Society, at any Historical Society, is not to tell just the good parts of the history, but you tell all the history, the, the, the bad parts as well as the good parts. Another uh, population that had uh, some difficulty in the Oregon years was, of course, uh, Oh, before we go there, uh, my favorite letter, I think, of all the letters we have in our collection is a letter, this is this letter here, 
Uh, it's a letter from a fellow named Delazon Smith. Now, when, as Oregon looked to become a state, we sent two folks back to Washington, D.C. to fight for statehood. Uh, a fellow named Joseph Lane, for whom Lane County is named after, of course, and a fellow named Delazon Smith, who was a newspaper man from Albany, Oregon. And their job was to travel all the way back from Oregon, and you imagine how much time that took back then, to Washington, D.C., to fight for statehood. And once statehood was achieved, they would become our first two U.S. Senators. It was a two-year-long battle, very tough, precisely because the Senate knew that Oregon had voted to enter as a free state. So the southern state senators were opposed to Oregon entering the Union, a very delicate balance back then between the free states and the slave states as the lead up to the Civil War. And the slave states of the free state senators were a little suspicious because Joseph Lane was known very widely and vocally as a pro-slavery proponent. And they, were, they knew Oregon had voted to enter as a free state, but here they were being represented by slave, state, by slave supporters, and they thought maybe there's a double cross going on. And don't you think all those liberals in Lane County would love to know their county is named after a, a guy who was very much pro-slavery? Pro so, but finally, after a two-year-long battle, we, we achieved statehood, the Senate votes us in, and at that day, February 14th, of course, Valentine's Day, 1859, is statehood day for Oregon, Delazon Smith sat down at his desk and he hand wrote this letter, the very first letter written after Oregon became a state, and he wrote it to his wife. And he says, my dear wife, the long and painful agony is over, exclamation point. Oregon is a state within this glorious union, two exclamation points. After a long and desperate struggle, we have most gloriously triumphed. And he goes on, we were admitted by a majority of only 11 votes. Talks about how the, the debate, the question of admission was debated three full days with much great ability. And being a good politician, he says, I have ordered 12,000 copies of the speeches for distribution in Oregon. So I've already taken advantage of that congressional frank uh, very early. But my favorite part at the end of the letter, he says, and now I must close. My never dying love to our precious children. Tell them to be good and obedient and remember their pa. And I will, God willing, come home soon. And if I come back here, they and their ma shall come with me. So, uh, and the, the show, oh, my other favorite part, he writes, I had a great many letters by the last mail from Oregon, and then underlined, but not one from you, my own dear Mary, <laughs> exclamation point. I looked with great anxiety through all the list for your letter, but alas, it was not there. But fortunately, there was one from Mr. McConnell. From him, I learned that you had been in town and that you and the children were well. God be praised for the good news. So when we became a state, uh, <clears throat> Lane and Smith drew straws. The long, the short straw, or the long straw got to be a senator for one more year before having to run for re-election. The short straw had to come home immediately. Their term expired immediately and come home if they wanted to serve. Smith drew the short straw. So if he wanted to continue to serve a full term in the Senate, he had to come back and be elected. And as you know, back then, and until the 1920s, it wasn't the voters who, uh, who elected the U.S. Senators. It was the state legislators who elected the U.S. Senators. And he came home intending to run, as he made clear to his wife, but he was beaten by Senator Edward Baker, uh, who, for whom Baker City, Baker, Oregon, would be named after. And he died just a year later as a fairly young man under mysterious circumstances, we're told, in Portland. So. Uh, that's the story of Delazon Smith. Uh, one of the great heroines in Oregon history was a lady named Abigail Scott Dunaway, who for 50 years uh, was the leading advocate for women's rights here in Oregon, uh, giving women the right to own property, giving women the right to vote, of course. She came across on a, on a covered wagon with her family from Illinois, her mother dying en route. And she, as a young woman, 19, 17, 19 years old, had to help raise her other siblings. And she fought. Uh, long and hard to give women equal rights, way ahead of her time. And five times it went to the ballot. They were able to get it to the ballot in Oregon, the right to give women the right to vote. And five times we men voted it down. And it wasn't until the sixth time in 1912 when women finally were given the right to vote in Oregon. Ahead of the national suffrage, which was 1920, but still behind many of the western states, which were ahead of the game, Washington, California, Wyoming, they all give women the right to vote before Oregon did. And one of the great items in our collection is this handwritten letter, and it's a letter from Susan B. Anthony that she wrote to Abigail Scott Dunaway, thanking her for some 
uh, great hospitality that she had shown her when she was out here campaigning one time. And of course, the, one of the great stories of Oregon history, ironies of Oregon history, is that while Susan, while Abigail Scott Dunaway was one of the leading advocates fighting time and again to give women the right to vote, one of her leading opponents was a fellow named Harvey Scott, her brother, and unfortunately for Abigail, editor of the Oregonian. Then as now, the most powerful newspaper in the state, he editorialized against it constantly. Uh, can you imagine the Thanksgiving dinners these two might have had together? Uh, Abigail once, or Harvey once famously said that women would get the right to vote over his dead body. Well, he died in 1910, <laughs> uh, and then they got the right to vote in 1912, so it all worked out for, for everybody. Uh, and then another a, a great, uh, one other thing we have down here, uh, I love this. This is uh, from our collection. This is a program and menu from a banquet that was given in honor of Susan B. Anthony at the Willamette Hotel in Salem, Oregon, Thursday evening, February 15th, 1900. And I, I, I love it because of the menu they served. This had to be some banquet. Here's, a, here's the menu, much like the menu we had today. It is uh, fresh eastern oysters, turtle consomme, lobster, chicken salads, French olives, sweet cucumbers and dill pickles, roast turkey, cranberry sauce, roast chicken, boiled ham, boiled tongue, French sardines, banana fruit, marble and sponge cake, star kisses, crescents, chocolate declares, lady fingers, navel oranges, apples, bananas, pineapples, French fancy mixed candy, assorted nuts and raisins, lemon ice cream, coffee, tea, chocolate, and milk. That's some banquet, so back, back in 1900. I get asked a lot uh, to describe really what does the Oregon Historical Society do? How do you define what we do? And one of the best definitions came in a letter uh, from a New Yorker, of all people, back in 1900. And the fellow who was the first uh, me, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a guy named George Himes, he, who helped founded the OHS and served as its director, he wrote to a, a lot of noteworthy Americans saying, we've, just, we've founded the Oregon Historical Society, here's what we're saving, here's, what we're, here's our mission, what do you think? And he got back some letters. And he got back this letter in 1900 from the governor of New York. And he says, my dear Mr. Himes, I want to thank you for the publications you sent me and to wish you Godspeed in the work you are doing. It is precisely the kind of work which will be invaluable to the future historian who writes the great epics of the colonies of the West. You preserve records that would otherwise perish. Exactly what we do today. We preserve records and artifacts and collections uh, that would otherwise perish. And you lay the foundations upon which the mighty historic master of the future must build. How's that for a mission? You lay the foundations upon which the mighty historic master of the future must build. With great regard, faithfully yours, Theodore Roosevelt, who was then the governor of New York. Uh, later that year, would be nominated for vice president by the Republicans, would win with McKinley, and then become president in 01 upon McKinley's assassination. So as I like to say, Teddy Roosevelt endorses the Oregon Historical Society. What, what, what gets better than that? So, uh, and one of our great programs for the last five years is we have brought out, courtesy of our good friends at Wells Fargo, the nation's leading Teddy Roosevelt recreator. I mean, in the genre of, you know, Hal Holbrook as Mark Twain and James Whitmore as Will Rogers, this guy puts him to shame. You truly believe that Teddy Roosevelt has come back to life. He looks exactly like him, has memorized everything he's ever said and written, it sounds exactly like him. And we take him around the state, uh, offering him to historical societies in schools for free because Wells Fargo picks up the tab. And uh, Wells Fargo has already signed up to bring him back this coming May. Uh, we've had him, we've done a program for the Washington County Historical Society. We've taken him from Klamath Falls to Coos Bay to Bend, to, all around the state. We'll be doing it again this year. It's, it's great to see him in the classroom and to see kids get excited about history. And I've, I've long believed that history gets a bad rap in school. You know, it's memorizing names and dates and places. That's what people think. And as a result, uh, you know, now all the, the, as the big thing is STEM, science, tech, engineering, and math. And while that's important, history is important too. Uh, the great historian David McCullough uh, once said that history is who we are and why we are the way we are. And if we don't understand history, I don't think we understand the future. So there is a, a, a good uh, reason to have a strong state historical society. Most state historical societies are state agencies. <clears throat> If I were in Washington or Idaho or Minnesota, I'd be a state employee. I don't want to be a state employee. I, I'm a, we're a 501c3, a, a charitable nonprofit. We've always gotten a little bit of money from the state because they understood that if not for us, someone would have to do what we do. 
So over the years, with the funding has gone up and down as the legislative tides have gone up and down. So it makes it a little bit nerve wracking every legislative year getting an appropriation. We've, we've succeeded uh, greatly in the last couple of legislatures. They understand the value of what we're doing. Uh, so we are in a good shape now. As, as you might recall, about five, six years ago, uh, before I took over, uh, there was worry that the place was going to close. We were circling the drain. We've had some great progress since then. Multnomah County voters passed the levy. They provide us with some funding. Uh, the state has reinvested in us. Uh, we had some very generous folks remember us in their will. And uh, so we're in, in, in strong financial shape today to, to help uh, guide Oregon into the future so that our history is as great as it has been. So with that, should I uh, stop and take any questions you might have? So. Terry, thank you for an interesting presentation. It's nice to have history come alive. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I know you. I mean, yes. we don't know each other very well, but I'm going to make a request in public. I was wondering if the Washington County Public Affairs Forum could expect in May to hear from uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Well, there you go. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll check on that. So, right. yeah, so. I'm looking so forward to writing the press release. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're up for questions. Yeah, as a fellow Willamette graduate, I remember, go Bearcats. Yeah, I remember Thucydides, <laughs> the strong prevail and the weak perish as they must. But, uh, so, this, so you've survived. Um, in Washington County, we're, we've got the historical um, museum that's open, and, and we've got the Law Historical Society also. Um, what resources are there by way of grants that some um, startup historical societies, I know the Beaver Historical Society, I, I spoke there, gave my little somewhat um, sublime opinion on certain developments in Washington County, but what kind of grants are out there to, to, um, to help organizations get going? Well, there, there, are, there are a lot of, uh, there's federal government grants more so than, and then there are some state grants too, that are, uh, and little amounts that have been going to historical societies. Uh, and then, of course, private foundations, which we all apply to and, and look to, and then generous donors like Pat Reeser here in Washington County who has been very supportive of uh, both the Washington County Historical Society and the Oregon Historical Society. What we've tried to do, or I've tried to bring at, at Oregon Historical Society is because we are the, the big boy in the block, we're this, the, the head historical society, is to provide uh, the loan expertise to the county historical societies. <laughs> Every county in Oregon has a county historical society, mostly, except Multnomah County. Uh, we act as the Multnomah County Historical Society, but they get by, uh, as Mark knows, on just, you know, on shoestrings, on a few employees, and a lot of volunteers. So we've been, I've been loaning my staff out to other historical societies to go out to Burns, to go out to the Dalles to provide, you know, curatorial expertise and museum expertise and uh, facilities expertise, uh, doing what we can to keep... Uh, um, all the county historical societies up and running. It's it, it's tough, especially in bad economy when a lot of nonprofits are are you know struggling. Uh, but I think it's important to keep historical societies out. And most just and, and you know we we have the ability to have a full time development person, a grant person who's out there looking, whereas the county historical societies don't have that that ability. So we're providing advice on grants as well to the county historical societies. So. Harry Bodine, former member. A little history to start off with. Back in 1967, the Oregonian sent me down to Salem to cover a special session of the legislature. <clears throat> had two purposes. One of which was to rebalance the state budget, which was out of whack. The Ways and Means Committee decided to strip the Oregon Historical Society appropriation of $50,000. So I went back to the press room and I phoned Tom Vaughn. Tom Vaughn, the legendary head of OHS for 35 years. And, and I told him about this in, in his deep, sonorous voice. Oh, he says, this is a mortal blow. <laughs> <laughs> An hour later, he was in that building <clears throat> fighting for the 50 grand. <clears throat> anyway, so what, what is the legislature doing for you people down today? Well, we, uh, this last session, the 2015 session, uh, the, the gov former Governor Kitzhaber had originally put us in to his budget for 750000 for the biennium, so 375 a year. Uh, when Governor Brown came in, uh, she, as Secretary of State, in charge of the State Archives, knew, knew of the importance of us. We had worked together on many projects, and she indicated to the legislature that she would support an increase. And thanks to Senator Steiner Hayward, uh, who was the, the chair of the subcommittee, she, also supporter, it got raised to 1,125,000, which is what we got in the uh, the biennium this year. So 
Eventually, I would like to see it two million, a million a year. I think it would be a good, uh, you know, support for what we do for the state. Uh, but you always have to work at it. Thank you. You bet. My name is Bill Kroger. I'm a foreign member. Thanks for coming in. I'm impressed with your knowledge and especially your ability to remember all that those facts and information. I, uh, I'm not an Oregonian. I've lived here over, a little over 20 years. Well, you are an Oregonian now, okay. so. <laughs> oh, yeah, I lived here. But, uh, but I heard that Oregon was pretty much settled by Southerners, either from the Deep South or who had moved to the Midwest and came out. And I was wondering if you would just talk a little bit about that. But then the second part of my question is I'm a little interested. You talked a little bit about the race issues. And I, and I heard about a place called Vanport mm -hmm. or something like that, and then it got flooded out, and it was mostly black people. Right. And I was just kind of wondering if you would talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, yeah, originally, yeah, the Oregon settlers, a lot of them did come, of course, as did the, you know, came out of the Oregon Trail, came from the Midwest, from Missouri, <laughs> Kansas, uh, up, you know, up into Illinois, where Abigail Scott Dunaway came from, you know. The, the people who populated Oregon uh, in, the, in the Northwest all came from, from somewhere else, obviously. Uh, yes, Vanport was built, uh, there was a visionary fellow named Henry Kaiser uh, in the Kaiser Shipyards. Uh, Kaiser was a, we had a great lecture on Kaiser last week, a true visionary uh, as to what needed, needed to happen. Uh, so he built, you know, once, he had, once we had the shipyards here, produced 700 ships during the, during the war and the massive workforce, he wanted that place for the workforce to work. And as I said, African Americans came in uh, in large numbers for the first time. Famously, today, liberal Portland wasn't too famously liberal back in the 1940s, and God forbid that you know African Americans live where everybody else lived, so Kaiser had to build uh, the city of Vanport uh, for them. Uh, largely, it was, a, it was an African American community. Uh, and, and Kaiser was also ahead of his time as to daycare. Uh, they actually had a daycare center at the shipyards, because so many women were working, Rosie the Riveters working. But imagine that in 1940s, how revolutionary it was to have a daycare center at a work site. And then, of course, he provided health care to his workers. The Kaiser Health Plan, Kaiser Permanente, is an offshoot from the Kaiser Shipyard years. Just a, a really uh, a fellow who was ahead of his time. Uh, but the Vanport was then destroyed, uh, totally wiped out uh, by a flood in 1948. It was, it's, Vanport was located where the Oregon Exposition Center is now, <clears throat> down there uh, near the border to, to Washington. Uh, it became almost overnight the second largest city in Oregon. Uh, from, it went from nowhere to the second largest city of Oregon in a matter of three to four months as, as they built the community there. And then, of course, when it was wiped out, the population had to go somewhere else to live. And again, it being in the late 1940s when racism was rampant, uh, redlining was going on. Uh, there were only certain areas in Portland, very limited areas, where the African American community could move into. And, and uh, we've had a, we, we've done two exhibits at OHS the last year, a year and a half, on the African American history in Oregon. Uh, just got done with one called Community on the Move, which told the story of how they there was so much trouble in finding any place for them to live and to, to work in the 1940s and 1950s. And we're gonna do a third exhibit with them uh, coming up, I think, next year, which will bring a group called the Black Pioneers, which will bring it up to present-day African-American history in, in Oregon. Virginia Bruce, forum member, and uh, Cedar Mill resident and Cedar Mill history enthusiast. Mm, there you go. Uh, I'm interested in doing research at the Oregon Historical Society. I've never tried to do it. Can you speak a little bit about the requirements the costs and the kind of support that you get. When well, you we get have a world-class research. research library in, in, on the fourth floor in a fabulous staff. The cost, if you're a member, is zero. Uh, we're there to help. And the cost, if you're not a member, then you have you pay admission into the museum. Uh, but it, if you're there for any amount of time, obviously being a member is a good deal because uh, you come as often as you want. So. But then there's costs for getting copies of things? Yeah, obviously, we, if you're making reproductions and we've got a Xerox machine up there that's, you know, negligible cost, dime a copy oh. or something like that, I forgot what it is, but okay. we're... But getting good copies of photographs? Oh yeah, we, we can do that too. So okay. we've got a fabulous photographic collection, like I said, two and some two and a half million photographs last time I counted. Great. So... <laughs> Jim, Kate, 
forum member. Um, your wife was recently elected to Beaverton yes. School Board, and I thought you were involved with Multnomah County in Portland. So, can you discuss your family's involvement in Washington County? Sure, uh, we live in Beaverton. I, you know, I've, uh, we've been in Beaverton since. Uh, well, Becky's been in Beaverton longer than I have. I when I we got married. I was living in Washington D.C. She was living in Beaverton, and then when I returned home from Washington, uh, but she's—we've been. I've lived in Washington County since 1997, then January 97. So for the last 18 years, so and uh, very involved in the community. We have a—we have children who have gone through Southridge High School. Becky's been on a lot of committees there. Uh, I'm involved. I'm chairman of the board of Special Olympics Oregon. Uh, I've been chairman of that board for four or five years. Serve on the Oregon Law Foundation, which funds legal aid in Oregon. Um, on the board of trustees of Willamette University, so big, uh, big community involvement. So, Eric Squires, executive director. Uh, first, thank you. I found your presentation to be very informative oh, uh, and high energy, and just wonderful. You're wonderful to listen to. Oh, thank you. I'm curious if uh, you could share things that. Um, you being a, a really in a remarkable position to share uh, things get dumped off at your doorstep. And, and, and Absolutely so. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on things that people think that are history that are Good not question. something that you can archive or things that you'd like to get. And I, just basically, if I can open the door to you, talk about uh, how people perceive the, the narrative of what is an archive and, and put that in, a, in a, the, a box of what can you control and what can't you control with the rubric of your organization? We, we do get a lot of folks who call and basically say, Aunt Agatha has just passed away. Would you like this trunk I found in her attic full of the, what's ever in it? And uh, in, the, in the early days of OHS, back in, the answer was yes. They basically took everything as they built up a collection. And, and now the answer is, uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, we, we, there's no, we don't need duplicates of things. Uh, some things aren't in our mission. Uh, so we're very careful now about what we access, what we take, because once you take it, there are very strict rules and regulations, as you, Jim and Mark know, about how you can de-access something and either get rid of it or give it back or after, after you've accepted something. So we don't want to leave people on. Uh, also, you know, most things that are given to us, are, they're in the collection. Uh, which are they're, they're stored for research purposes. They're not on display all the time. Some folks want to give us something only if we're going to put it on display. Well, you know, we, we have a constantly rotating exhibit schedule, but if you give us something, it's not going to be on display 24, 24 7. Uh, what I'm told by our curatorial staff that we don't have, that they've been looking for for years, are men's work clothes from like the 1870s and 1880s. And, 1890s, men's dungarees, men's jeans, because essentially they wore them until they disintegrated. We have lots of fine clothes from that area, and women's dresses, and women and men's three-piece suits from that time, but no men's work clothes. Uh, so if you're going through your attic and you find some jeans or dungarees from back in the days, we'd be, we'd be interested. Uh, we had, we've had an event for two years now called What It's Worth. Uh, which I stole lock, stock, and barrel from the Idaho Historical Society. It's essentially it's our antiques roadshow event. We brought in 10 to 12 professional appraisers of different items, jewelry and clothes and knickknacks and antiques, and then we invite people to bring their their treasures in to get a non-binding you know estimate of, of what it might be worth. And people flock to it. It's it's a lot of fun to have people come in and especially see if something they have is worth much more than they thought it was. Is going to be worth so it's uh was august this past we'll, we'll do it again in next next august or september i think we do it once a year and uh, it's been it's been very popular but we do have a uh, a museum a trained professional museum staff uh that you know if someone says brought something into me and said do you want this i you know i'm dangerous i don't i don't know enough about it but turning it over to the professional staff is as they decide whether it should be part of our collection so very briefly, one yeah. last part of the apple there. Anything that just amazed you was dumbfounding that showed up at your doorstep for a donation? <laughs> Either good or bad. Disgusting <laughs> or horrifyingly wonderful. I think I've got some. Let me see if we've got something here. So. Uh -oh. Someone gave us, this is just a copy of it, there was this great... Uh, these two great Oregonians, J. Quinn Thornton and John and James Nesmith, uh -huh. was one of our first senators. They had an ongoing battle over what was the best route to come to Oregon. 
uh, back in the Oregon Trail days. One believed he'd come this way, one believed he came the other way, and it, it turned into a horrible feud between the two of them. And then someone gave us an original copy, one of the, I think one of the only one or two that exist, of what was called To the World. It's the famous To the World thing, and, and J. Quinn Thornton, or James Nesmith published this and, and printed out these handbills, and it says, To the World, J. Quinn Thornton, having resorted to low, cowardly, and dishonorable means for the purpose of injuring my character and standing, and having refused honorable satisfaction, a duel, which I have demanded, I avail myself of this opportunity of publishing him to the world as a reclaimless liar, an infamous scoundrel, a black-hearted villain, an errant coward, a worthless vagabond, and an imported miscreant, a disgrace to the profession and a dishonor to his country. Signed, James Nesmith, Oregon City, June 7th, 1847. Ouch. <laughs> yes. Re reclaimless liar, infamous scoundrel, black-hearted villain, errant coward, worthless vagabond, imported miscreant, and a disgrace to the profession and a dishonor to his country. How about that? So, wow. So, yeah, we have a, an original copy of, of the two, what was called the Two of the World. So some good terms in there. If you get in fights with anybody, you want to use those. John, you can put those in a lawsuit or something. So yeah. Nice. That's the second bite of the apple. <clears throat> you know, letters are very important. And all through history, letters have been a, a real guide. Not any longer. <clears throat> but now if we have emails, yep. in spite of John Kitzhaber's problems and so mm -hmm. forth, the question is, well, how is a historical society going to maintain records on emails? Well, that's. It's tough. Uh, I mean, as, if it's a government record, obviously, then it goes into the state, uh, the state archives. Uh, the state archives collects all the government records. We collect basically every, everything else. So if you're a government official and all the record of governing and legislating via email is now part of the archives, uh, we would get, get it if they make copies of it for us. But as far as any personal emails, it, it is tough. The art of personal diaries and handwritten letters and that's uh, sadly, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing almost we can do about it. So that's, that ship has sailed. Uh, but, and we're going to lose a lot of history because of it. So I'm sad to say. Thank you. Am I done? I, I can tell by the, by the slightly diminishing crowd here. And I say slightly diminishing because I think people really enjoyed well, the Well, I'm going to put one word in for, uh, it's been my pleasure to, to help some folks with some books. I've, uh, I helped four uh, Oregon business icons, uh, for lack of a better word, with their autobiographies. Uh, I co-wrote Gert Boyle's autobiography, One Tough Mother. Uh, Al Reeser's, the great late Al Reeser's, his biography, No Small Potatoes. Uh, Harry Merlot, who was the timber, timber king of, of Oregon, uh, called Vintage Merlot, and then Ken Austin of ADEC in Newburgh, uh, helped him this year with his autobiography called uh, American Dreamers. Uh, but I also helped my old bosses. I worked for a number of years in Washington, D.C. for Bob and Elizabeth Dole, and I've helped them with four books uh, since returning home to Oregon. Uh, the favorite being, Senator Dole, by the way, had the best wit in Washington, D.C., and I did two books on political humor with him, one called Great Political Wit, laughing almost all the way to the White House, and one called Great Presidential Wit, I Wish I Was in This Book, by Bob Dole. And it's a compendium of stories and jokes and anecdotes told by our presidents. Uh, but instead of going chronologically from Washington to Obama, as many of these books do, we did something different. We offered the first ever ranking of presidents by their sense of humor, from the funniest president to the least funniest president. We called it the Dole Poll. And what we discovered, and I think it's important to say in these times, when we need more humor in politics, is that the presidents that we ranked as the worst sense of humor, the biggest sticks in the mud, uh, folks like uh, Millard Fillmore and Franklin Pierce and Benjamin Harrison, these are all presidents, by the way, uh, they're presidents that historians have ranked as the least successful. And the presidents that we ranked as having the best sense of humor are presidents that historians have ranked as having the most successful. And Senator Dole thought it proved a point that as his hero Dwight Eisenhower once said, humor is part of the art of leadership. It's part of getting things done. And I think that's something we've lost uh, over time, the importance of, of uh, having a sense of humor and not taking yourself too seriously in politics. And for those of you wondering, by the way, the top four that we ranked were Teddy Roosevelt, number four, Franklin Roosevelt, number three, Ronald Reagan, as many of you might have suspected, as number two, and Abraham Lincoln as number one. 
not just the funniest president, but one of the funniest men of his time. A uh, scholar from that era said that Lincoln raised the level of wisecracking to the level of biblical scripture. Uh, <laughs> And being, uh, you know, an a, a attorney, a circuit writing attorney in Illinois, he had to have an endless collection of jokes and stories and witticisms and anecdotes to tell his judges and juries and, and clients. And uh, the very, you know, most famous Lincoln story, perhaps, is when, uh, again, he is a self-made man from the backwoods of Kentucky, did not like pompous people, of which even in 1860 there were quite a few in Washington, D.C., as there were today. And the story of the fellow who came into the Lincoln White House early on and said, Mr. President, the Chief of Customs has just passed away. I would like to take his place. And Lincoln looked at him and said, well, if it doesn't matter to the undertaker, it doesn't matter to me. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the fellow didn't, didn't get the job, so. Uh, but my favorite, I'll end with my favorite story, uh, is from William Howard Taft, our 27th president, better known as our fattest president, weighing in at some 350 pounds. And Taft knew that the most important rule of political humor is that it be self-deprecating. You make fun about yourself. You join the laughter about yourself. You don't lash out at other people as so many do today. And Taft knew the many jokes that were being told about his weight. And he loved to tell the story about how when he was an attorney in Ohio and he was riding the rails from appointment to appointment, he was at a train station one time and the, the train station manager came up to him and said, Mr. Taft, uh, it's the economic policy of the railroad that the train will only stop if there are three or more people waiting for the train. It's the only way to, to make money, and you're the only one here, and the train won't be stopping. And thinking quickly, Taft said, he sent a telegram to the train station before his, and the telegram said, large party awaiting you at next stop. And the train stopped. Uh, but and Taft also liked the story of, there's a senator from New York named Chauncey Depew. There's a good name for you, Chauncey Depew. And Depew was introducing Taft at an event in New York City one year. And he got up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that President Taft is pregnant. <laughs> Everyone gasped by what was, you know, this insult to Taft's big, big stomach in his weight. And then Depew went on. He said, yes, he's pregnant with virtue. He's pregnant with integrity. And Taft got up to speak and he said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want you to know if what is said is true, if I am pregnant, if it's a boy, I will name him virtue. If it's a girl, I will name her integrity. But if, as I suspect, it is only hot air and gas, I will name him Chauncey Depew. So there's a, no doubt who had the best, the, the best line there. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have nothing to add to that. That was absolutely fantastic. I will say that Asia Panis will be with us next week from the THPRD. And uh, gosh, I will close with that. I will warn you, in January, watch for some really good flow. There'll be an evening program that you'll learn more about later, uh, co-sponsored with the City Club. That's just a little teaser. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We'll see you next week.